examples. And I usually take these out of these slides, um, but this is where we are. We're at number seven, uh, chapter seven rather, um, managing risk. You can see we started with the introduction, strategy, organization. Now you can break that down into who's a project manager, forming your teams, and then what do we need to outsource. Um, but systematically, introduction, strategy, organization, define the project, um, largely uh, milestone one there come up with some estimates, project networks, and now managing risk. But if you go back to the last chapter, I just want to touch on this really quickly. Hey, here's your start. Here's your finish down here. Um, these are pretty sequential, but as you get into like organization, you can actually have dual roles going on. You can develop a project manager, develop your team, decide what you're going to outsource at the same time that you're defining your project, uh, project making estimates, building your project networks, which we talked about last chapter and then moving into managing risk. Next, um, we can look at um, uh, monitoring your progress, which is a kind of a dual role back to project networks, where, so we're doing this now, so it's, I know we're doing this week by week, but if you think about it, as you build your projects, we're talking about managing risk and what that means, but as a means of scheduling resources and your costs, you can monitor your, your progress while we're also building our team. Now, we'll eventually we'll get to outsourcing and reducing duration and all that. And then long run, way over here, end of the semester, we'll talk a lot about um, what agile project management is and going international with our projects. So anyway, I just thought every now and then I would like to provide, you know, hey, where are we uh, on this map? And now you guys know um, the flow of this map if you've watched uh, the Chapter 6 lecture. Uh, it's a project network. It's an arrow to node um, system where sometimes we have some uh, dual actions here and then um, having things come back together sequentially and then uh, we disperse. So um, really neat, really neat how they set up that for these chapters. So risk management, what's the risk management process? Well, first risk need to, needs to be defined. Risk is an in, uncertain event or condition that if it occurs has a positive or a negative effect on project objectives. People typically think risk, they think negative, but there, there can be some positive things too. No amount of planning can overcome um, or control risks. It just happens. Right, what's risk management? Well, that's an attempt to recognize and manage potential and unforeseen trouble spots that may occur when a project is implemented. No matter what you do, something goes sideways. So what can go wrong is a risk event. How to minimize the risk in, uh, event's impact that's the consequences, the impact. Uh, what can be done before the event occurs? You can anticipate um, some actions that you can take in case an event occurs. And what do you do when an event occurs? You have a contingency plan. We always have a contingency plan in project management, even sometimes even in the course. Um, looking at the risk event graph, uh, we're talking about the early stages, so this is kind of time and process at the bottom, bottom axis here. It's the project life cycle. So you start out by defining it, you start executing, and then hopefully you deliver. Well, your risk uh, in terms of the cost is very, very low to start. Uh, you don't have a whole lot of money invested, but as you, ex as you start ex executing the project, the expenses go up. And then when you begin to deliver on the project, the cost goes up. Thus, the risks go up. So it's tied directly to how much money you've got in the game. Um, now, the chances of risks occurring are much higher when you don't have a whole lot fleshed out. So when you're just in the defining stage, you've really got to move this project forward uh, because the risk is high that you won't get anything done or make progress as you get through this life cycle. So while the costs go up over time, the risks start really high. And if you're doing a systematic planning of a project, your risk goes down over time. It's never really zero, but it does go down. So what's the benefits of uh, focusing on risk management? Well, it's proactive rather than, rather than reactive. Uh, it reduces surprises and negative consequences. It prepares the project manager to take appropriate action. It provides better control over the future and improves the chances of reaching project objectives on time within a budget and uh, meeting the required performance requirements. Um, the risk management process, uh, you have step one, identify the risk. Okay, analyze the project to identify sources of risks. There are known risks then. Then you assess the risks. Assess risk in terms of severity of potential impact, the likelihood of occurring, and controllability. Once you've done that, you can make a risk assessment. Um, 
Step three is a risk response development. Develop a strategy to reduce possible damage and develop contingency plans. Risk management plan, um, once you have that contingency plan, you can have a response control. So you can implement risk strategy and monitor and adjust the plan for new risks and change management um, styles or who's in charge or what happens um, out of that. So um, guess what though? You're just a few mo few weeks, months, days, whatever down the line and new risks are going to emerge all along here and you have to go back to step one, risk identification. Um, it's really, you talk about managing a project, you manage your life like this. Um, just being aware of what the risks are. If, if, you, if I do X, Y might happen. If Y might happen, Z might be the outcome. So it's always good to be thinking through and planning and and uh, especially at your age, um, as you prepare to be young business people and manage your money and manage your time and everything, your all resources, you should be doing a bit of risk management along the way. So step one, back here, step one, risk identification. Generate a list of all the possible risks that it could affect the project through brainstorming and other uh, problem, uh, problem, or other problem identifying techniques. I can read. Um, focus on the events that could produce consequences not on project objectives uh, that are not on the current project objectives. Use risk breakdown structure, RBS, to, in conjunction with a WBS, the work breakdown structure, which we talked about um, previously, to identify and analyze risk. So basically where you took your project and you broke it down into little pieces, look at those little pieces and say, hey, what could go wrong here? Um, identify the macro, also the positive, what could go right here? Identify the macro risks first, then uh, specific areas can be checked. Use a risk profile, which is a list of questions to address traditional areas of uncertainty on the project. As the reading goes a little more in depth in there. Let's look at an RBS, a risk breakdown structure. So you have this project, right, that you've broken down into smaller pieces. Well, you look at risk in terms of uh, the technical, the external, the organizational, the project management itself, and the customer. Technical, we look at, hey, what requirements are they? Technology, interfaces, quality. External, hey, who am I depending on here as suppliers or subcontractor if the project you're managing is construction? What regulatory agencies are I dealing with? OSHA, whatever. Uh, what's going on in my market? Is the economy down? Uh, what's going on with my customers? Man, what's going on with the weather? It depends on, you know, if you're building swimming pools and it's pouring rain, it's going to be hard to dig a hole in the ground. Uh, organizational. Uh, project dependencies, uh, you know, resources. Do we have enough resources? Do we have enough funding? What's the priority here? Is the project dependent upon other departments that are being affected? And what is that? You know, look at your organization and say, wow, this is how this project can really move forward. Or wow, this is really how this project could get torpedoed. Now, where we're focusing here is project management. Sharpening your skills in terms of being a project manager by making you better at estimating, planning, controlling, and communicating. Um, you know, that's kind of sounds like our project here. Estimating, planning, controlling, and communicating. Almost in that order. Almost. Uh, we started more with planning um, in the first two milestones, and then we'll move into estimating and controlling, and then wrap up the semester with communication. So the customer, uh, what's going on with them? Will they accept the project? You know, the outcome of your project? Is this a new uh, process within the corporation? Is this a new product? Is this a new service? Um, the coordination of that, getting it to the customer, the training, showing them how to use it and supporting them after the fact. Uh, potential risk profile for a product development project. Um, this is the list of questions we were talking about. Like technical requirements, are the requirements stable? Or is, is it in a volatile uh, market or a volatile technology? Design, does the design depend upon unrealistic or optimistic assumptions? Whew, I've graded stuff like this all the time and people are like, ah, it's going to work out because of these three, three reasons. That could be good. It also could be very overly optimistic. Um, so make sure you back it up and tell me exactly why you think it's going to work out. Testing, will testing equipment be available when needed? Development, is the development process supported by a compatible set of procedures, methods, and tools, i.e. have you done your homework? Uh, is the schedule dependent upon the completion of other projects? You know, how do these two, how do these things flow depending on what else is going on? And then how reliable are my cost estimates? Quality, are the quality considerations built into the design? Do people know who has authority for what uh, within the team, within the company, within the customer base? Uh, you know, I say within the customer base here because do people know if they have the authority? A lot of people create something to sell to kids, but the problem is parents decide what kids buy. 
So make sure you're, you're, you're dealing with the right authority figure all the way down to the customer. Uh, work environment, do people work cooperatively across um, functional boundaries? Staffing, is the staff inexperienced, understaffed? Uh, do you not have a finance person, that type of thing? Uh, customer, does the customer understand what it will take to complete the project? Um, you know, this is somebody, let's say you're managing it for a customer, uh, the project. Contractors, are there any ambiguities in contractor task definitions, i.e. contracting? Um, step two, risk assessment. Scenario analysis assesses the significance of each risk event in terms of probability and impact. Risk assessment form evaluates the severity, probability of the risk events and detects its, and its detection difficulty. Will you see it coming or will it surprise you? Risk severity matrix uh, prioritizes which risks to address. Failure mode and effects analysis, FMEE, uh, FMEA, rather, uh, extends the risk severity matrix by uh, including ease of detection of the equation. Risk value equals impact times probability times detection. Probability analysis using statistical techniques to assess the project risk. Decision trees, net present value, that's a pretty important uh, calculation that you should have learned in financial management, program evaluation, and review technique. Thus, the PERT simulation and the PERT uh, graphic. Now, in the towards the back of this chapter in the appendix, there's a lot of um, uh, mathematics. Um, that's not the focus of this course, so take a deep breath. But um, for those of you who are interested, it is in there and... You know, it can separate you from, you know, the statistical analysis can separate you um, in in the job market. So um, deep breaths that it's not a part of the any test or, or the project in here. But if you want to wow me, explore it a little bit. Um, define conditions for impacts uh, scales of risk manager uh, risk on major project objectives. Examples of negative impacts only. That's what most people think about. So you have these project objectives. You have a cost, you have a time, you have a scope and a quality. You, you, you have goals here and objectives that you want to hit. And then um, risks in terms of one to five, very low to very high with a moderate in the middle. Uh, insignificant cost increase, very low. Less than 10% cost increase, 10 to 20% cost increase, 20 to 40% cost, anything over 40% cost increase is high. Uh, it's kind of like a sliding scale here. Um, time, insignificant. Again, uh, time is a big thing that you allocate less than 5%, 5 to 10, 10 to 20. Risk goes up as you uh, have to spend more time than you anticipated. Um, scope, again, you have scope creep that you know project in the end gets to be so wide it's effectively useless. Quality, again, uh, high quality, low risk, low quality, high risks. This is what that looks like in a, in a form. Um, so risk assessment form here. Uh, likelihood, impact, detection, difficulty, win. Uh, interface problem systems, freezing, user backlash, hardware malfunctioning. We go back to our repeat, repetitive example in this reading about um, automation and uh, developing a software um, for a manufacturing process in a, in a warehouse situation. So you can score it, and then as you score it, you see things get higher. There's high risks here. Um, four is pretty high, two is pretty low, one's very low, five is really high. So you can start to see what your risks are. But you have to identify what your risks are, then score them, and then say, when is this going to happen? Um, when we convert um, over to the new interface, system freezing at startup of the, of the new project, uh, post-installation, some, some, some backlash by the user, and then hardware mal malfunctioning in the installation seems to be a big concern here. Um, so if you look at this in a risk severity matrix, again, FMEA, the failure mode effective, uh, or excuse me, effects analysis, the impact times the probability times the detection equals risk value. So what does that look like? Well, when you have a relatively low likelihood and not a whole lot of output here, um, things stay pretty green. Um, even at, you know, a higher likelihood when you're low production, um, it stays pretty green. So green is good. Green is uh, minor risks. Um, as you produce more and as you inherit more risk, it kind of goes to yellow, right? You know, yellow is moderate risk. Um, as you produce more, 
and you deal with these things that are more risky. So when you deal with these things like, hey, hardware manufacturing at, or how, I can't speak tonight, I'm sorry. Hardware malfunctioning um, at installation, you start to move over here. You get a lot more risk. So it's kind of a, kind of a sliding scale that you see there. And then if you look at, um, you know, all the different uh, possible things you could be doing, I wanted to go back to a graph here. Graph here. See, as you get over here, you see this cost, your risk goes up, so related to cost, okay? As you're back here, the risk is high, but you haven't done a whole lot, so that goes down precipitously over time as you better plan your project. Um, so that relates directly to this graph. All right. Um, step three, risk response development, mitigating risk, reducing the likelihood that an event will occur. That happens with good planning. Reducing the impact uh, that the adverse event will have on a project. You'll have a contingency plan, avoiding risk, changing the product plan to try to eliminate risks or condition it, uh, transferring risk, passing risk to another party. For example, you have fixed price contracts and you have insurance. Like if, if you know, if a facility gets damaged by a storm or something, you've bought insurance for that. So that's mitigating risks. You build your own operation transfer, boot provisions, uh, escalating um, risk, notifying the appropriate people within the organization of the threat, retaining risk, making a conscious decision to accept the risk of an, of an event occurring. <laughs> Half the battle is just knowing something could happen. And when you know something can, ha can happen, you develop a contingency plan. So a contingency plan is an alternative plan that will be used if the possible foreseen risk event becomes reality. A contingency plan is a plan of action that will reduce or mitigate the negative impact of the risk event. Take out insurance, for example. Uh, it's also not a part of the initial implementation plan. It only goes into effect after the risk is recognized. So you've got to have your, he have your head on a swivel of saying, hey, what could go wrong? And then also, what can go right? Risks of absence of a contingency plan? Uh-oh. Uh, you cause the manager to delay or postpone the decision to implement a remedy. Leads to panic and acceptance of the first remedy suggested, which is a form of bias. Um, it's a, a solution confirmation if you're in my market problems and solutions class. Uh, make the decision make, uh, making under pressure, which can be dangerous and costly. Thinking fast, thinking slow, slow down, step back, assess the situation, and make a call. Risks and contingency planning. You have technical risks, which are backup strategies if the chosen technology fails, like if you're making your presentation on that board in our classroom, and for some reason it doesn't work, you still got to present. Um, assess whether technical uncertainties can be resolved. Schedule risks. Expedite or crash the project to get it back on track. Um, Schedule activities in parallel and use start um, start to start lag relationships, which we talked a little bit about when we were building um, project networks last chapter. Use the best people for high risk tasks. The most dependable people, generally speaking, respond to uh, things going sideways a little bit better. Cost risk review price to avoid the trap of using one lump sum to cover the price of risks. Be smart about it. Funding your risk. Evaluate the ri the risk of reductions and funding a cut in the project. Remember how we said we built in like, you know, a bit of, um, we talked about that last chapter, we built in a bit of lag, um, a bit of slack. You have to do that with your money too. You have to budget for miscellaneous costs. You have to budget for unforeseen costs. That's just true in life, man. That's not just a business thing. That's true for you. You need, you need an emergency fund. Opportunity management and opportunity is an event that can have a positive impact on project objectives. By the time we start talking about something positive, exploit. Seek to eliminate the uncertainty associated with an opportunity to ensure that it definitely happens. Uh, put yourself in the best possible situation to exploit an opportunity. Uh, share. So that's to allocate some or all, or all of the ownership of an opportunity to another party who is best able to capture the opportunity for the benefit of the project. Keep your head on a swivel in terms of who's most qualified to be on your team. Enhance. Uh, take action to increase the probability and the positive impact of an opportunity. Escalate. Notify the appropriate people within the organization of the opportunity. Um, always communicate. That's so important. Accept. Uh, be willing to take advantage of if the opportunity uh, occurs, but not taking action to pursue it. So make sure you make the call there and you have, you're have you looking for good opportunities as well. Contingency funds, we touched on lightly, are funds to cover project risk identified and unknown. 
For control purposes, contingency funds are divided into contingency reserves, which are covered, uh, cover identified risks and allocated to specific segments and deliverables on the project. So you got to think about this. Do I need liability insurance for my event business? What do I need? How much is that? Can I get a price on that? How much money does that build into my budget? Management reserves cover unidentified risks and are allocated to risks associated with the total, the total project. Time buffers, we talked about lag. I'm sorry. We talked about lag last uh, last class when we were talking about building a project network. Time buffers are amounts of time used to cushion against potential delays in the project. Adds uh, activities with severe risks. Add to, so so if you got like a part of your project that's going to be kind of risky, give it extra days. Just, just plan it. Add to merge activities that are prone to delays. Add to non-critical activities to reduce the likelihood that they will create another critical path. And add to activities that require scarce resources. So add time. Build in Slack. Step four, risk response control, risk register. Details all the identified risks, including descriptions, category, probability of occurring, impact, responses, contingency plans, owners, and current status. Risk control involves executing the risk response strategy, monitoring trigger events, you know, have a plan for what could happen, and then monitor what are indicators that that thing's about to happen. Then you can initiate your contingency plans and watch out for new risks. You can establish a change management system, a CMS, monitoring, tracking, and reporting risks, uh, foster an open organization environment, uh, repeat risk, repeating risk identification assessment exercises, and assigning documenting uh, responsibility for managing risk. You know, as a sidebar here, I think about my church. I actually work as an usher, and we also have a security team, and the ushers in the security team, the security team is much smaller than the usher team, um, we communicate directly. So if we see something that looks a little shady going on at church, you know, you never can be too careful. We have a change management system to where we can report it to the security team and they can make sure everything's going to be copacetic. I don't know. That's, that's mitigating risk. Uh, big churches, they have to have that. Small churches, they really need to have that. Anyway, changes in control management, sources of change, project scope changes, implementation of contingency plans, improvement changes, Changes in management systems. Identify proposed changes. List the expected uh, effects of those proposed changes on your schedule and your budget. And sometimes it happens on the fly, right? Review and evaluate, approve and disapprove the changes formally. So basically, your plan is never going to stay the same. It's always a living document. It's always going to need to be updated. Negotiate and resolve conflicts of change in condition and cost. Uh, communicate changes to parties affected. Uh, assign responsibility for implementing change, adjust the master schedule and the budget, track all the changes that are to be implemented. Neat. It's been a minute since we've had a graphic in this chapter. Here we go. So change originates. So you get this change. Change request submitted. Hey, we have this thing we need to change to, to mitigate risk. Review the change request. Is it approved? Yes, move on. No, go back and let's submit it again under different conditions. Uh, if it is approved, yes, update your plan of record and distribute for action. Okay. Uh, benefits of a change control system. Inconsequential changes are discouraged by the formal uh, process. Uh, costs of changes are maintained in a log. Integrity of the work breakdown schedule um, and performance measures maintained. You're just kind of tweaking it and, and adding to it. Allocation and the use of contingency and management reserves are tracked. Responsibility of implementation is clarified. Your plan gets better and better and better as you add to it. Effect of changes is visible uh, to all parties and, and all parties involved, rather. Implementation of change is monitored. Scope changes will be quickly reflected in the baseline performance measures. All right, so these are all the upsides of these control systems that you can put in. Uh, Appendix 7.1 goes into PERT and a PERT simulation. I highly recommend you take a look at that. Highly recommend you take a look at that. Again, do not get um, overwhelmed with the mathematics you see there. Again, that's not a big part of this course. Um, you know, if, if you're into that type of thing, take a look at it. It's definitely something that could set you apart from your competition in the job market, but not ultimately the point of this class. We do have some business analytics courses that we have that, we have that can add to that. And again, financial management with net present value is a, a good thing. Um, just make sure you look at the PERT and the PERT simulation. Uh, what is a PERT? Perfor uh, excuse me. Program evaluation and review technique. PERT. PERT.
program evaluation and review technique. Assumes each activity duration has a range that statistically follows a beta distribution. Uses three time estimates for each activity. Uh, one that's optimistic, one that's pessimistic, and a most likely time estimate um, to represent activity duration. So think like uh, best case, worst case, and likely case. From these three time estimates, a weighted average, a time estimate, and a variance is calculated. This is the mathematics part of this chapter. Knowing the weighted average and the variances for each activity allows the project planner to compute the probability of meeting different project durations. The longer the project duration is, the higher the probability of the meeting of that duration. So it's literally like a statistical null hypothesis that's a likelihood of addressing that. I may add a separate video that actually dives into the mathematics for those of you who are interested. If you'd like to learn more, just come by the office and I'd love to talk to you um, a little more about how the statistical analysis can add weight to the PERT analysis. Um, one thing I did want to do, and forgive me while I hop over to a website here, it's a good example of a PERT chart, okay? Um, PERT chart example are flow charts that display project tasks in separate boxes. Again, it looks like an arrow in, um, an arrow in node. You have the start of the project, task one, okay? It's going to take four days, task two. So you're going to do tasks one, two, and three concurrently. So let's say we have a team of six people, two people on task one, two people on task two, two people on task three. Task one is going to take four days. Task two is going to take six days. Task three is going to take two days. Task three folks jump to task five onto task eight, and then they come back together. Task one folks go from task one to task four to task seven, and then that brings them back into eight, which goes to the end. And then task two, go to task five, combine forces with, with uh, task one folks and on task seven, and then everybody gets back together in task eight, and then we have an end project, product. Um, quite frankly, the, these, you know, don't confuse this class with developing a business plan. You wouldn't see something like this in a business plan, but this is how you would roll out your business as a project. So you would need a PERT chart example, and you, you know, I'm gonna see that in, um, in uh, excuse me, in uh, milestone two. We'll talk a little more about that in the direction we're going there. Um, again, here's a Gantt chart. Think about these as bar graphs. These are weeks or days, you know, whatever. It's probably weeks in this example. Um, so task one, two, and three, this is the time you're going to spend on them. So task two, it looks like, is that days? Let me go back up here. Yeah, six days. These are days. Okay. So task two is going to take six days. Task one is going to take four days. Task three is going to take five days. You see how we did this? These are days. Okay. And then from there, uh, we're going to jump down to task four, which is going to take from day five to day eight. Looks like three days. Task five from day six, six and a half to day 12. And then task six is actually occurring at the same time. Task five will take a little bit longer. It looks like task two is the longest task here. Task five, uh, maybe second longest. Then we're all going to end up on task seven from about the 12th day to the 15th day. And then on 16, we're all working together on task eight, and we're task eight, and we're done by day 20. See how the see how the the Gantt can represent the PERT. See the days here. You add them all up, it would be about day 20. You have a Gantt and a PERT working together. There's your Gantt. There's your PERT. Sweet. Okay. Uh, let me go back over here. Forgive me as I adjust my screen here. That's chapter seven, managing risks. I'll see you in the next chapter.